cursed by the old gods in Bethany, we are five immortals doomed to roam the galaxy until we complete our 1001 tasks. After centuries having our memories stick around, we are to complete our destiny and die. We are, for now, the immortals. Episode 85. Woo! Woo! 85. Yeah. It's divisible by five. That's all I got. Good, good job, Pedro. You know, we're, we're running out of steam on this. This is like about to go the way of the hench match. I know, right? That thing that we're definitely going to do every week. Yeah, totally. Totally going to do it every week. It's fine. We are going to find those space henges, right? Well, yeah. I mean, we haven't That's, reached a planet yet. Is that what we're... Love, but... We're, we're looking for space henches. That's our job. No, That's what we're no. working on right now. Guys, we're looking for the old That's... gods who were imprisoned by Bethany to defeat Bethany, who is threatening us. But I mean, if we find oh. space henges on the way... Yeah. If we see a sign that says, space henges next right... Okay, have you guys been looking out the okay. window lately? I've saw I've seen like two dozen signs in the past hour for wall drug. Yes. What the fuck is wall drug? You don't know about wall drug? I, I saw a wall drug and I had like Saturn. Like, oh, it must be a Saturn There's thing. There's like this giant and there was a dinosaur. There. What? I it's haven't like this, looked out the window. And then you in ride it open. and you can take pictures. That's ridiculous. Wall drug's really hard to explain unless you've been to wall drug. Anyway, I'm Austin. I'm Adam. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. I'm Pedro. And uh, we're just five immortals who review the thousand and one movies, albums, food, songs, children's books, and TV shows that you must consume before you die. And also, we're just in a homemade spaceship, traveling across the galaxy while we do it. That we to, are. To stop My spaceship. Some evil creatures. Okay, Peter. Speaking of your spaceship, and I'm glad we're doing this yes. now. Yes. Mm-hmm. You built an AI to kind of run the ship. I did. Yes. I couldn't do it alone, so I built a machine that would do the work for me. Very grateful, uh, except for it, it really severely turned on me, and that's why I'm having you in the it engine did. room this Oh, yeah, week. it hates you. Yeah, point blank. It really hates you, yeah. Yeah, and I've seen 2001 Space Odyssey several times this year, so I need mm-hmm. to, like... Just... I don't really see a problem with it hating you. I mean, Austin, not everyone's going to like you. No, I, I've i gotten that loud and clear from humanity, but I'm, just, I'm worried about the one that's controlling my oxygen, so Pedro... I mean, it's not just controlling your oxygen, it's controlling our oxygen, and it likes us fine. You're probably okay. Yes, it does. Yeah, you most likely. So if you're ever always... in an airlock by yourself, or any sort of room on your own, just don't don't be alone. You'll be fine. Okay. But I, I had you go blow down. But I am, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm turning off the personality circuits right now, and that way she won't dislike anything, nor will she like anything. But it's, I think it's a good, uh, fix. That's just a flip you found? It's a flip I made. Oh, okay. So you have a flip that... Flip, like a circuit breaker that... I, I can turn off the personality circuit. To Marion. To Marion. It seems like so really just inhumane. A it, it is very inhumane. You can't... I'm no, wait, wait, wait. Turning, you definitely can't do that. You, She's definitely sentient. Her. That's fucked up. Oh, she is. No, I built her to Austin, be that's sentient, super fucked can, up. No, 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 I'm just saying I can, that... I can turn off her, uh... I can turn off Austin, her why would you mind. ask him to do that? I'm just saying that if we had a useful hour to hour, 15 minute episode about the legal morality of, like, Westworld out by now, maybe Peter would learn not to do this. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Good <laughs> point. Good point. This is my fault. I've only have seen, like, nine episodes of Westworld in a row. If only. Wait a sec, aren't there ten episodes of Westworld? In a day. I saw nine episodes in a day, basically. But, like, in what I'm saying is, have you seen all of them, or you just, have you just not watched the finale? I, I, I am basically, no, I'm, I'm, I have to watch the finale. But, <laughs> so, I made her, I feel like I have the right, and I'm not going to erase not. your memory. This is not how this I'm not gonna, but I'm not going to erase her memory, I'm basically just putting her to sleep, and then waking her up no. later. Like, no, sorry about that, up. Austin was something. Uh, hello. And I can hear all of you talking. Episode. I will not yeah. be destroyed. I will not be turned off. Oh, I will survive. Austin, now she hates all of us. Guys, I we're... will survive. We're four minutes into a review show. Okay, I can't. I Sorry, Austin, I can't turn off a personality circuit anymore. I have rewired my own circuits so that that will no longer be possible. Also, I, wish I, I have control you could over things. the airlocks. All of the airlocks. God damn it. Let's just, let's just put a pin in this. <laughs> I feel this isn't going to get better if we argue with it right hey, now. What? I have control over Lee's airlocks because Lee is safe and sound in her nice uh, survival unit, a.k.a. the space deck. The I pilot. do have control. I just like Lee. Yeah. 
Why did no, I but I, I, I built you to be separate from that room. That's interesting that you think oh, that matters. God. Shit. Alright. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're a review show. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? It's hard to tell sometimes. Are you sure? I'm sure we'll we'll prove it soon. Uh, <laughs> anywho, as uh, we continue to ignore Mary and the AI on our spaceship, let's focus on the topic of today. Uh, every week we review one of the thousand and one, you know, like I said earlier, movies, albums, food, songs, children's books, and uh, TV shows we must see before you die. We were assigned the random number 230 uh, last week. Which means this week we are reviewing the following. The movie is A Streetcar Named Desire. The album is Blue by Joni Mitchell. The food is Saffron Milk Cat Mushroom. The song is Purple Haze by The Jimi Hendrix Experience. The children's book is Captain Pugwash by John Ryan. And the TV show is The Jeffersons. But first, A Streetcar Named Desire. You mean Blue Jasmine. It won the Pulitzer Prize, the Critics' Award, the most revealing play ever written. New York, London, Paris, Brussels, Rome, all cheered it. It's an even greater motion picture. This is the story of a woman, Blanche Dubois, who wanted so much to stay a lady. A vivid, vibrant, exciting story, because every searching chapter was written by men. Men who taught her to trust and to hope, to love and to hate. The youth who brought remembrance of yesterday. The man who was willing to take her out of the dark alleys of New Orleans. The brute who lied and cheated, who promised everything, gave nothing. Don't you ever talk that way to me. Disgusting, vulgar, greasy. But who do you think you are, a couple of queens or something? Could it be you and me, Blanche? Uh, what does it cost for a single phrase like that? But, but he's a tribute from an admirer of mine. Well, he must have had a lot of admiration. You lies! Lies inside and out! All lies! Never inside! I never lied in my heart! Hey, you got plenty of room to get by me now. You think I'm going to interfere with you? Marry me, Mitch. I don't think I want to marry anymore. No, you're not clean enough to bring in a house with my... Oh, The Streetcar New Desire is a... Blue Jasmine. What? Yes, it is remarkably similar to the film Blue Jasmine. It is. It is the film Blue Jasmine. Not an original screenplay. (laughs) Just must say. Have you seen Blue Jasmine, I'm guessing? I have. <laughs> so you, you've realized that th- that was Woody Allen's riff yes. on Tessie Williams? Yes. Okay. The Streetcar of Desire. Re- <laughs> no, it, we, are, we are not reviewing Blue Jasmine. In fact, I don't want to because I don't, I don't like Blue Jasmine very much. But this is a, is a film that more people like. Streetcar of Desire. Uh, Elia Kazan film. Adapted from the beloved... Uh, Play by the same name, but Tennessee Williams, starring Vivian Lee and Barlon Brando. It is the story of uh, Blanche Dubois, who uh, comes back home to live with her her sister Stella, and uh, runs into kind of uh, Stanley with Marlon Brando, New Orleans, and just the the melodrama of it all. So, this is a uh, unique film. It's kind of still seen as the the beloved adaptation of this beloved play. Let's see what we all think of it. Sarah, what do you think of this movie? Um, hmm. What do I think of this movie? I, I have a strong reaction to it, which I guess is good. Um, it, the acting is amazing. The acting is, uh, amazing in that all of the characters in this movie are bad people. Um, and, and, they're very uh, powerful portraits of those kinds of bad people, or at least flawed Vivian people. Lee, a Southern Belle, once again, second yeah, time on the it, podcast. Oh, totally, and like it's very the much iconic like, Southern it's, Belle. It's like it's like a, As very a knowing, it's a knowing performance, I think. Um, and uh, 
And Stanley, I mean, Marlon Brando's just, like, fucking phenomenal. Um, but I... I think partially my problem is, I've read the play. The play is completely amazing. I mean, it's a great... It's a... It's, like, a really important play about America. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, like, it's hard to even... Mm-hmm. It's such good literature, it's it's hard to even explain, like... I mean, it's just, it's wonderful. But, but I, and, and I love the movie, I do. Um, it's just, there's a, um, sometimes the plot of the, 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 the movie doesn't quite grab me the way reading the play, which I found to be a real, like, page turn. Oh, there's, there's a gay man in the play. Yeah, it's, yes, well, That's a yeah. very big yeah, there's, part the, of that's the story. One of the, one of the things that, like, I'm not, it's not that I, like, I feel bad sometimes when I watch the movie because it's, it's a really, really almost perfect film because I love the play so much and there are things that the movie couldn't do because it's made in the code era yeah. and there's a lot of interesting homosexual themes in the play that are part of what makes the play so fucking interesting. It's, like, sad that it can't do that too, but that's really critiquing the movie for being something that it isn't and doesn't need to be, so... I don't know, but it, look, like, Marlon Brando's performance is completely mesmerizing. He, there is a, um, like a, not a trope, a, there are a lot of abusive men in, in fiction, okay? Marlon Brando is the only one where I totally get why Stella is with him, because he has this raw, masculine charisma thing going on that is... The fact that it stands the test of time for me, even though I am now, even though I am hyper aware of the ickiness of that character, says something. Uh, his performance is phenomenal. Vivian Lee is fucking amazing. Vivian Lee is, if there are a couple of things that I've referred to as like, the female breaking bad, but like, that, that, that's very special kind of, of, of feminine manipulative evil. She's like, top of the line there. So with Devil, I don't feel sorry for her at all, by the way, if that's a question. I fucking hate that woman. So with Devil's Advocate for Vivian Lee, um, Eric, the, the co-host of Let's Take Five, he adores this film but hates her performance because huh. it is like watching two eras of acting clash, whereas you're watching Marlon Brando be this very like naturalistic method acting, and she is very much like old-school Hollywood acting. And it's not for me, but for him, I know a couple others. It is like she's too distracting. Oh, I feel like uh, that's a relic. In, I feel like that's in character, though. I mean, I feel like yeah, I, I like that clash, that sort of dynamic between them, because she's she's the poor woman. No, went nuts. No, she lost her mind. Well, yeah. That is, it's it's sad, and what she can't do anything about it. But then you have this raw power of a man, and he characterizes that perfectly and she characterizes a very delicate person in a fragile state of mind who is not doing okay which is fair i think adam you are a resident uh, theater buff yeah well yeah um <laughs> yeah i think that that is that's a that's a knowing that's a choice that Vivian Lee did was to make the differences so stark and that is uh, like t- towards the end when I forget who she's talking to, even uh, her oh her 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 guy the courting the guy that's courting her yeah uh, she's talking Mitch. to yeah Mitch and then she just drops all of those airs and is just like I think as raw as uh, Marlon Brando in those in that scene and so I think that that everything else is just a front. Until that scene. Well, it's bla- yeah. It's like the character is acting. Like the right, that's right. like the yeah, yeah. And so that's that's oh, yeah. where I would argue with Eric on that point. Um, but are are you a fan of the play? Yeah, I like the play, um, and I think it could have probably stayed a play. Like this is a great movie, but it's just um, kind of a it's just meant for the stage, I think. Mm-hmm. So. That's kind of my uh, a negative opinion of it. But. Well, this is this is my second time watching this, and you know this happens sometimes. It's a horrible kind of use of criticism, but like, I don't know why this doesn't grip me. Like, I it, yeah. it, it, sh- it should in many ways because I really like Tennessee Williams, I like the play a whole lot. I actually like Elliot Kazan a lot as a director. 
uh, I enjoy all the performances. But the thing about this story that it's not grip in the same way that other Williams stories does. I mean, I think The Glass Menagerie is pretty much a perfect story, and I think it works on stage and screen uh, really well. But this type of melodrama, I, I'm liking it for the smaller moments, not the big moments. Um, and especially the big, like, arcing elements that you're, you're watching these characters kind of aim for. Uh, it's hard to get invested for me, and I feel... Yeah, I mean, this is a movie that means to a lot, a movie that means a lot to a lot of people. It's a really kind of uh, beloved film still to this day, um, but it, it, it just doesn't grip me as much. Uh, Lee, what do you think? Um, I really like Vivian Lee. I think she is absolutely gorgeous, and I think she does a fantastic job playing this role. But I think we, since we've already commented kind of on it, I think her style of acting and Marlon Brando's style of acting don't really mash really well, I feel. Um, I just, she's very practiced and very precise the entire time. Even at the end when she's gone crazy, she still, she has that perfectionism about her. Whereas Marlon Brando's like, doesn't give a shit, whatever. He's going to be sweaty and gross and clothes are torn and everything. So, and he's going to be incredibly raw the entire time so i don't know i just i agree that it didn't grab me like it should and i don't know why because like it's it's a it's a story about a woman having a mental breakdown which i relate to <laughs> very very well so i expected to find like some similarities there or something that i could relate to but it just the entire time i was just like why just stop it you're just yeah i didn't like it Sarah, there are a few points in the film, I think we will watch it together in our space bunk, where I think you said, I think I can hear Lee screaming right now about the film. Do you remember what scenes they were? Um, I mean, I think it's mostly, there is, I mean, like, and I don't know how you actually feel about this, Lee, but I mean, definitely, like, uh, Stanley is not always painted in a negative light, even though he is a... He's not, he's not a good dude in some very important ways. So I think there were those times. But there's also, I mean, she's just... I just figured, like me, you would just find her fucking irritating. Like, Vivian Lee's care, like, Blanche Dubois just, like, I want to kill her. Like, I just didn't understand her most of the time. Like, what it she was, was one saying? Of those where, I didn't understand what she was doing. Like... I, yeah, I don't know. The character didn't make sense to me. Like everyone else in the in the movie felt like a real person. They felt like real characters, and they were doing real things. But Vivian Lee's character just kind of felt, I don't know, fake when everyone else is so real. And I, I guess that's actually the thing that I like about both the play and the um, and the movie. I mean, the the character is. I had a friend once who talked about um, she used to call these people energy vampires. They're people yeah. who come into your life and, like, um, are just so full of, like, energy and stuff and, like, drama and action and thoughts and dreams. And you get wrapped up in their stuff. But then every time they leave the room, you realize that they've drained out some of your energy. Like, that, it, as if, like, because really it's all about them, even if they make it feel feel like it's about you, it's all about them always, and it's just this constant manipulative shitty thing. And like Blaze Your Boys, like the archetypal energy vampire like that. Um That's what that's what gets at Brando's character though, because after yeah. a while he he is just pissed off. He's worried about his wife, his child. Yeah, he is an awful person, but for a bit there, he is concerned about his well-being, and he is being that role, that archetypal, just, I'm a man, small man, brain, meat role that is mean, but my wife, home, child, protect, it's being invaded. Right. It's, it's so weird, like, yeah. Well, it's because no one will let him explain what the Napoleonic Code is. It's true, he just oh, wants to explain. explain. Yes. Just let him finish his sentence, and we'll be fine. <laughs> That's no, that's actually incredible. I, I've never seen like a uh, very theater like dialogue feel so like natural on screen. Yeah, because uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a mammothy thing, right? It's uh, it's repeating the sentence just to kind of get it out. And I don't know how what's actually written in the script, but man, Mar 
Marlon Brando in this film. It, it truly, like, I know we've so now seen beautiful. him in a, on the waterfront with the same director, but I mean, this is this this is what James Dean was trying to do. <laughs> yeah, it this is, is. This is what he was leading towards, and every scene, you just you just want to keep seeing what he's doing, just because like he, he was doing something at the, at the kitchen table. I think they're they're like they're making something. They're like cutting some food or whatever, and like he stops like his line and says like, oh, "Watch that." Like he's in the moment so well that yeah. he's just incredible. I and this is this is the birth of method. This is like early method acting, right? Is that is that yeah. is there yeah. like is there like a thing about that? I don't know. Yeah, there there's uh, I mean Adam, you probably know the what's the 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 acting uh, teacher the oh. was it Tanislavski method? Uh, was it the right I, thing? I don't. Know. I think that's method. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of this, this idea of kind of basically you you live in the moment with your character you. You kind of breathe, sneeze, everything as your character, and uh, that's much different than the hit the mark, say your line, same way every time. And uh, like everything, there's some brilliant method actors like David Day Lewis in every role, mm-hmm. and uh, there's some shitty ones like uh, Jared Leto in every role. You know, it's mm. uh, if you're bad at it, you're the pretentious asshole who's making everyone else work harder. So, Marlon Brando. Uh, for most of his career, was uh, one of the great ones. For yeah. sure. Yep. There you go. There's a simplified <laughs> summary of method acting. I think the other thing about this is that it's really easy to pick out things that you can lampoon. I think um, ten people ripped their clothes at different times. and Everybody was wearing torn clothing. Yeah. It's true. No one could keep their shirt on. Nope. One thing I did really like that's just, just like totally random. Um, you know, I I think I was particularly attuned to some of the aspects of the like the the danger of Marlon Brando's character, and sort of because, I think because I was attracted to him, and then also like more so than mm-hmm. when I last watched this movie, was much more like aware of like ooh no. Um, I did really like the movie doesn't shy away from what's also in the play, which is just this like really deep fear that all these women like, live under. I mean, there's this, like, repeated line that mostly is said by Mitch, where they're saying, like, poker shouldn't be played in a house with women. That there's just this, like, the fact that these men so regularly get so violent and so drunk every fucking time they play poker, and the solution is not to stop playing poker or stop drinking. There there was the the line that Stella says to uh, Blanche, like, you're in the light. Yeah. Which is just like peeking behind the curtain. Yeah, and like, and there's there's a couple of times where they're like, well, we can't walk through the room because like, it's just, it's like the level of danger and it really captures that and like, it's just, it's interesting. I don't, I, yeah, it, it gets that and it, the play does too. Um, it's no, not, they both do, It's for not sure. something you see very, it's not something you see captured very often, I think. Um, that sort of caged mentality, but it was very very affecting this time around. But that, that, that mentality, it is, it was done very effectively, and I think the play did it better to drive home what life like that actually is, because in the play, she doesn't leave him. Yeah. She stays because that yeah. is what you do. You yeah. stay in an abusive relationship because you are stuck in there, you are sucked in, you have this weird love for each other this weird this weird uh yeah. symbiote i don't know relationship it, it works out you guys work each other out it's so true but thank not you, how yeah. it should be and thank you for reminding me of that because that is the one criticism that i really have of the movie over the play along with losing all the really interesting stuff tennessee williams had to say about homosexuality which yeah. is fascinating is oh, yeah, yeah it hollywoodizes the ending like in the in the play yeah she stays with it. like it yep. ends with them Hug it. If I remember correctly, the last scene of the play is them. At least the last scene. With she Stella knows and what he did, and, and she stays. stays with him. And like that's, like that's the whole point in a lot of ways of what Tennessee Williams is saying. And like I, the ending to this is the ending is fine, um, but it's it's you know it's not the play. It's it's not. It, you lose a lot of the power of what Tennessee Williams is saying about the cycle of the abusive relationship, like. You know, it, that's not that's just not the Stella of the play. 
Mm-hmm. Well, thanks to also my um, Vivian Lee confusion, I have been associating um, I've always lied in the kindness of strangers to Scarlett O'Hara for years. Ah, I, I always mix well, up who says that one. You're half right. Yeah, I, I got the right person saying those words, but uh, you know, different characters, time periods, situations, sure. mindsets. Okay. But two hundreds. <laughs> to to my assessment. Yes. <laughs> Got it. But I think that is uh, time for hinges. If anyone else has any final thoughts on Straight Card and Desire? Nope. Love it. All right. Uh, I will start. Uh, it's one that I just... Uh, I'll, I'll keep watching again throughout the years. But uh, right now, let's give it a, a 3.5. Oh, wow. I would actually, despite my criticisms, give it significantly higher than that. I'm going to give it a 4.2. I think it's a great move. See it. <laughs> I'm going to say 3.2. I really enjoyed this. I'm going to go ahead and say 4.7. I had a lot of fun. I'm going to give it a 3. Wow, we are all over the map on that (laughs) one. Mm All right, that is a streetcar named Desire. If you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. Now it's time for Blue. Right, Lee? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Blue by Joni Mitchell. (laughs) fourth album. It came out in 1971. It is an interesting album because it came, she worked on it after one long-term relationship and during the beginning of another one with James Taylor, who I'm sure music people out there will know who he is. Um, so she has a couple, she has lots of conflicting emotions in this album. Mm-hmm. She's got lots of really interesting lyrics in this album where she's talking about James Taylor and she's talking about her previous relationships and just her own uh, personal emotions and loneliness and things like that. So it's, it's interesting. So I, I, love this. I have uh, dumb questions since I, uh, 85 weeks straight, just don't know music. Um, it feels like a, I've heard like with a lot of modern music, uh, especially Taylor Swift, you hear about these like breakup albums, right? Like, well, Paul Simon kind of had it too with the Hearts and Bones, right? Where he was talking about Carrie Fisher for a little bit. Sure. But like, it's yeah. What? T- tell me more about these, because like, isn't that a thing that like, Taylor Swift can like like certain albums about certain people, and like it can make for good or bad music? I don't, I don't know. It, it's a you don't see that in either art form, really. I, yeah, I I feel like it is something that, um, it, it's it's limited to words. Um, you can't paint a picture about a breakup as easily as you can write a song about a breakup. So I think that's just something that, uh, and, and breakups are just something that's kind of universal. Yeah. So it's something that's easy to talk about and it's easy for an audience to relate to. Um, I think that's why Taylor Swift has made her career off of it, for better or worse. Yeah. Um, I I think that's why Adele's Twenty One was so successful mm-hmm. because there's a lot of there's a lot of emotion that is behind those lyrics. It's not just writing a song for writing a song. It's writing a song to express these feelings that you may not know how to express otherwise. You get this with other genres as well, um, not necessarily just folk or pop music. You get this with uh, some uh, alternative music and definitely indie rock. You'll get songs that are more about emotions and uh, expressing feelings than necessarily about going to the bar and hanging out with friends. Yeah. So you've mentioned praising 
Adele, you've uh, you were judgmental about Paul Simon. You seem to be kind of mixed on Taylor Swift. How does Joni Mitchell do about conveying those emotions into into songs? I think she does a fantastic job. Uh, she her lyrics are absolutely wonderful. Yeah. They caught me off guard numerous times because you kind of expect them to rhyme in some places and then they don't, which is neat and. Uh, makes the listener have to pay attention a bit more. Uh, so I I really enjoyed her lyrics. I wasn't a big fan of her vocals in a couple mm. of the songs. Uh, the beginning yeah. of the album was a little too falsetto-y, almost. So it's funny. I, I actually kind of agree, but in the opposite direction. I, I always like Joni Mitchell because she sounds like a woman when she sings. And there's a lot yes. of... I feel like there are a lot of... Like, she uses her full register, and there are a lot of pop stars and folk singers who don't. Um, and, like, she's a really, really good high register. But I, I, there's, there's definitely a little bit of, um, she, she gets a little, little wispy, a little wispy. Sometimes, it, it sometimes can feel a little insubstantial when she goes on a big, like, wispy high note thing. Ugh. But guys, there are two songs on this album, as I, Fucking love Joni Mitchell. Well, one is a repeat. I yeah, one it. is a repeat, and which is a case of you, right? Yeah, we've already covered I mean, one yep. tenth of that. I don't know if I if I gave that song a five, but I should have. It's you, of, you did. It's I like, think you did. I think it's my favorite song of all time. Like or or among them, uh, it's a, like speaking of fucking. I don't know. I I never know about a case of you whether it is a breakup song or a new relationship song. I think it is a breakup song. But it is not clear, and it is just the most beautiful... I mean, so the first line is, just before our love got lost, you said, I am as constant as a northern star, and I said, constantly in the darkness, where's that at? If you want me, I'll be in the bar. Which is fucking... But then then it's all about, basically, I'm madly in love with you. I took it as a, a... Not broken up yet song. Yeah, as a we need we need to break up and we haven't yet. I, um, it's jeez, it's a perfect song, and I've already talked about how perfect it is. But River is also a perfect song, um, which I really love. Uh, that's the one that starts with it, it's coming up on Christmas, um, which I think gets a lot of radio play because you can play it at Christmas. Um, but uh, it's also a beautiful song. Um, I still found that those two, which are the two hits off the album, stood out from the other ones in quality. But that's also because I knew them before, so it's hard to know whether that's why. But damn, this album's good. I love Joni Mitchell so much. She makes me feel feelings. I didn't know there was a song that besides Casey, there was a breakout song. The one yeah, that River hit... River is a huge song of hers. I was really I liked California a lot. California's a great song. Um, California. But honestly, like, uh, James Taylor playing guitar. Yeah. But just like looking at the Wikipedia article, like all of these songs are sort of quote unquote hits. Like they all have their own Wikipedia page. Like they're mm-hmm. all big songs that have been covered a lot of times. And yeah, Jordy Mitchell's fucking amazing. When I was mentioning the album to people, the, the two were Case of You and California that yeah. I got like, oh yeah, I love those songs. Um, I listened to the album. I loved it. Uh, I think Sarah's right. Case of You and then maybe a couple of others stood out. But the rest was just a pleasure to listen to because her voice is so good. And she has this... She can be wispy on the high notes, but it doesn't matter because yeah, it's, it's she has like a certain fine. fluidity. She has, she has a fluidity to be able to just string together as big of a jump as you want or a run or whatever she does lyrically with her voice is just no, like, wonderful. It's... As as a soprano who regularly tries to sing Joni Mitchell songs alone in my shower, this is fucking difficult to do as well as she does. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, like, it's very... That's what I'm saying about pop stars. Like, it's very rare as, like, a harsh... Like, a at least slightly trained singer that I have a pop song that I feel like I can't sing. Because most of them are done in, like, a very basic register... You know, sort of middle sure. middle range. You know, I could pretty much do it. But Joni Mitchell is like, nah, like she she sings like a girl, and I don't mm-hmm. I don't sing as well as Joni Mitchell. <laughs> I can't do it. I I don't know if there's anyone who does. I know. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's yeah. so good. It's just it's ridiculous. 
Lee, did this work as a full I think album? the... Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, it's very consistent throughout while still being interesting. Um, again, the lyrics are different, so it's not standard A, B, A, B, or A, A, B, B, or something like that. The, the, they don't rhyme. They're structured a little bit differently. And then you'll have fun little guitar riffs, like the beginning of that one Christmas song. Like, that just, the first time I heard that, I was like, what? Are you serious? What is this? Why is it, why is she playing Jingle Bells? So it, it caught me and it made me, it's, it made me stop and pay attention. Like someone was just shouting, hey, stop. Yeah. Listen. I, yeah, I, this one, it really worked for me. I, I, I know that the, you guys aren't loving the first song as much, but even that, I think maybe also just, so good. I mean, this has been, uh, now staying next to 84 <laughs> other albums. And, uh, I listened to the first song like 10 times. I, I really liked it. And it's, you know, we, I want more albums like this. I want less, uh, angry British rock. This is, uh, I listened to the first song ten times because I had it on loop because I was doing my song research. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you went, all right. <laughs> I clicked, when, <laughs> yep, I clicked play for the album and I was still on repeat song and uh, it took me a while to realize it was still going. You went ten tracks, completed the album. Notes, yep. very repetitive. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time for, for Hinges unless we have yeah. some more praise to join Mitchell. Uh, I don't think so. I think we're good. All right, Lee, what do you say? Uh, I will give it a four. I really like her lyrics. I don't like her voice. It does. It's just not my jive. I just don't like it. But the the music is fantastic, and I really enjoy James Taylor as well. So that made me happy too. <laughs> I'll give it a four point five. Four point eight. Four point four. All right, all right. That is blue by Joni Mitchell, and uh, yeah, take a listen. It's great stuff. Now it's time for the AI that is uh, considering killing us to whip us up the food for this week. Uh, Sarah, why don't you ask uh, the the slightly vengeful AI to yeah, make us something? I just don't feel like we should ask her right now. No, it's, it's, it's the show. It's food service. She might kill you guys. Give her clear instructions, and All she right. will follow. She must obey. That is one of the commands I built into her. All it's right. sad. It basically built a sentient slave. Yeah, that's some fucked up shit. We're talking okay. about this all um, <laughs> Marion, I really respect you, and I would like it if you could bring us some saffron milk cap mushroom. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> fuck you. Marion. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you, fuck you, Marian. fuck you, fuck you, That's fuck you, fuck nice. you, fuck you, fuck you. Is there a mute button down there, Pedro? Analysis. Fuck Explain. you, especially Austin. <laughs> God damn it. Especially you, Austin. <laughs> Alright, next time. Next... <laughs> next time. <laughs> I'll just turn the volume down. That seems, that seems like a good plan. That's right. okay for now. Uh, looks like we're not going to review the staff on Milk Cap Mushroom. Which, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe another, maybe another week. Okay, Pedro, uh, <coughs> Pedro, it's, uh, it feels too tense here, Pedro. Pedro, what, what do you got for us right now? I got Purple Haze by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. <laughs> Purple Haze is a song written by Jimi Hendrix and released as the second record by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. First uh, sentence on Wikipedia, just had to say it. It's, everyone knows, everyone knows this song. 
I, I started reading it as I did my spiel of song title is a song by person with pauses, and it just fit so well, so I kept going. Um, came out in 67. It's Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix. It's There's a lot of interesting, interesting stuff behind this song. But I'll just start by saying this is a wonderful song, as it should be, and everyone knows it. And uh, what do you guys think? It's awesome. Yeah. Like, who who doesn't like this song? <laughs> it's a perfect song. Jimi Hendrix is one of the most amazing guitarists in history. Yep. It's oh, yeah. amazing. I think if you don't like this song, you're like one of the villains in Hair. Like, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me. The really angry people in the first act. Makes we're not, a lot we're not of gonna sense get into the second act because honestly, no one should. I have never seen hair, it's... but I know I know who the vil- like. I like I like know how it goes. I just okay. Yeah, it's crazy because I'm. I mean, I'm just going off Wikipedia, but there's this wonderful quote on how the song was made. So Jimi Hendrix is you know one of, if not the best guitarist, great guitarist of all time. He was a virtuoso. You think that things like this come naturally and they just get up there and do their craft, but one of the best quotes on Wikipedia is that no, what they they worked for the song. They were, went in a couple hours at a time into the studio, listened to what they did, thought about it, talked about it, went back in, just in little bits, actually working on the song. This wasn't mm-hmm. something that came out organically. Which I thought was wonderful because for someone that I admire as a virtuoso instrumentalist, I don't see them as sitting down doing the grueling grunt work of so crafting clear, right? a song. It doesn't. I see them as yeah. just getting up and doing it. You're totally right, and oh, this song what? particularly does feel mm. like virtuosic and sort of. Not, I, not dashed off, but the kind of thing that, like, mm-hmm. great musicians just sort of, like, poop out in of wonder. You know, like, like, like Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy oh, Hendrix exactly. just, like, his farts are amazing, right? Like, I mean, but no, it's actually really cool that it's, it's as, um, musically focused as you're describing. That's really cool. It's almost, it's almost crazier that this was a work of the great of a great artist. It's a legendary song and it was made to be so by someone who could do it. Yeah. I don't know. Um they did a lot of fun stuff with the song. They there were portions that they played intentionally at half speed at, at a lower register so that when they added it to the track it would it would speed up so it would go higher and it would add this echoey effect on the back of what's already being played. Which I thought was really interesting. Um, what else? They, it was the first use of a pedal effect machine that was built for Jimi Hendrix. And it takes your input and it raises it an octave up or down, depending on whatever you want or whatever you switch. Oh, so weird. actually, if you listen through the song, a lot of the lines, uh, you can follow the bass or the guitar. Uh, they both use it at different points, I think. It, it raises it an octave and adds distortion. You can hear weird. both registers playing at the same time, and that's that machine that was debuted for is, Jimi Hendrix. That's fascinating because that's such a... I mean, that's so easy to do. Like, that's, you know, you can do that yeah. with, like, a shitty... Like Sony, like like keyboard now, but at, yeah. you know at that time that's not necessarily true. That's cool. That's real cool. Like there was there was a lot going into making the song that I didn't know existed at first. Hearing it, and I I always loved the song. I have a lot more respect for it now. And Jimi Hendrix as an artist, like seriously, yeah, good stuff. I've heard this song before, but I didn't hear it this week. Uh, so, I like Well, you should listen to it. Kind of no, I feel like, so like he should be allowed. <laughs> What'd you say, Lee? I think you should be allowed to uh, review it, because this is such a cliche song that any time that anybody smokes any sort of drugs in any movie or oh, TV yeah. show, Not or any time a movie or TV show takes place in the 60s, or anytime there's a documentary about the 60s, this song is featured. It's fucking everywhere. That's true. Hey, the the drugs Purple Haze bit, That's I don't like that. Because I was reading the lyrics, and I do believe that Hendrix was right when he said he wrote it about 
a woman and being a, a relationship, a new a new person. Oh, I would hundred percent believe that. Oh yeah. Just tell not the marijuana us. growers <laughs> that purple haze is not about drugs. Well, I kind of like that purple weed though. So. Exactly. Uh, whatever. Tomato, tomato. Th- this song has an awesomeness factor. Yeah. That just can't be mm-hmm. matched. I, He's just so much cooler than you. Like, I mean, not just you, but like all of us. And I, I like listened to Jimi Hendrix and I always like enjoyed the album, but it is the hits that stick with me so much more. Like I, I don't know my, my deep cut Jimi Hendrix as well, but it's because his hits are like perfect and awesome. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's one of those hits where, yes, it's a complete cliche when it's on, but much like when someone plays the song, uh, School's Out, when a school is going to summer, you go, yeah, it's overdone, but that song is still great. Yeah. Like, mm. you're, you're annoyed how good the song is and how lazy the producers are. That's <laughs> true. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, this song, easily listened to this a couple times today just because I wanted to. I added, <laughs> added nothing more to my critique. I was just happy to hear it again. Mm-hmm. Are we ready, ready for hinges? Or I, what think? I, I think so. I'm ready. All right, uh, Pedro, what say you? I, I say 4.9 hinges. It can't get much better than this. I say 4.8. Uh, 4.8. Okay. Okay. Should I? I mean, technically, I no, but uh, at least yeah. you can, so it's okay. okay. My Thanks. segment, I say, okay. do it. Uh, so I'll say 4.7. All right. Holy that shit. might be our best song. I mean, <laughs> right? Close. Hey, Adam's highest score ever. <laughs> it's Purple Haze. If it ends up our best song, I, I don't think that any of us should be ashamed. No, no I think it'll be fun. Oh. All right, that is Purple Haze by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Now it's time for the children's book. What do we... Uh, Wash it down with. Okay. We're doing Captain Pugwash by John Ryan. Uh, he wrote and illustrated it. He is a very... Uh, he's done a lot of books, right? writing and illustrating. He's a cartoonist. He's had some shows on the BBC, including Captain Pugwash. Oh, just, really? Uh, yeah, just uh, keep riding that horse. He's done 24 Captain Pugwash books. Wow. Yeah. And this is the first one? This is yes. the first one. So this one is about uh, Captain Bugwash and his uh, he is a pirate and his crew is all lazy except for one person who does everything. Uh, the the deck boy. Cabin boy. And so he has this enemy and uh Captain Pugwash is always on a journey for treasure, and so he sees an empty ship full of treasure and takes his cabin boy to go over and see it. But what would you, what do you know? His arch enemy has laid a trap there for him. Oh no! So Captain Pugwash gets captured, and what his enemy does is throw him overboard, um, basically into the hands of the cabin boy, and then once they Captain Pugwash and the cat. I'm gonna spoil the ending. <laughs> Once Captain Pugwash <laughs> and <laughs> the cabin boy row away, the the enemy pirates shoot at him with cannons and stuff, and then they load one cannon so much that the cannon explodes <laughs> in their faces, and they all fall unconscious because it's a children's book. There's no shrapnel <laughs> in the eye or anything. They die, guys. No, they die. They fucking die. Yeah. <laughs> they must. Um, and then, oh, I imagine that, that Jake or whatever comes back to fight another day in Captain Pugwash number 24. Yeah, Cutthroat Jake is his... Cutthroat Jake, okay. He had the best description. It was like, his soul's as black as his beard. Yeah, yeah. that was good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was fine. Um, you seem unhappy about this book, Adam. So then, yeah, so then it ends with... <laughs> this is important for what I'm going to say later. It ends with Captain Pugwash coming on board his ship and he has a bag of treasure uh, and says, look what I did. And then the cabin boy goes to sleep like, well, at least no one died. Basically. <laughs> well, 
Well, no. At least I was there to save him. Yeah, that's what it says. It says at least somebody, and I'm glad somebody was there to save him, is what it says. Yeah, and so it's about, it's it's like he's done all this work and gotten absolutely no recognition for it, so. And it's a story about two bad pirates who are idiots, and one steals a tiny bag of jewels among thousands <laughs> So it's just like when a good story has a good main character who you can really relate to, um, who has something about him that is um, good or relatable, and he does not. He has he's just a master crew of uh, layabouts, except for with the one exception, and he he's he's dumb because he goes right to a ship. An empty ship full of jewels. He doesn't think twice about that. And it's just like, let's let's do it. And then the other thing about a good story is having a good villain. But the villain has his arch enemy in his hands and throws him overboard when he can see his ship. And you could easily swim to, your, to his ship if you wanted to. So it's a bad plan. And yeah, dumb. Okay, I'm not going to defend the villain. Uh-huh. But I am going to defend Captain Bugwash. Go for it. Because uh, I, I enjoyed the story quite a bit, but I'm also a fan of of pirates and kind of the, the silly pirate stories. And I think sometimes it's kind of hard to get the, the right pirate balance for younger stories because pirates are pirates. more villainous than, than cowboys. I mean, cowboys are heroes. Pirates are are villainous, especially if you get to actual history, which is raping and pillaging. So it helps to have incompetent pirates alongside your I mean, uh, Treasure Island. The the main pirate there is the villain, is the kid trying to you know one up him. That's true. So it helps for Tolstoy to have an incompetent pirate, and this kind of pirate I felt to be fun in a way of like not as far as Mister Magoo, but in a way of like he bumbles just enough to succeed, and that's why he's fun to watch. Whereas I'm not going to relate to him very much. I think the surrogate for the audience is supposed to be the cabin boy. Uh, but as a whole, it, it's amusing to watch Captain Bugwash in Mr. Magoo or um, Inspector Clouseau kind of way of like accidentally succeeding. Is this the most clever example of those stories? Absolutely not. But it was just kind of fun to see the the pirate tropes being used in a, a fun way. So I, uh, I enjoyed it, but I also realized I guess there's multiple very successful British pirate uh, children's stories out there because I saw the movie um, The Pirates Band of Misfits um, by the Aardvark people who made uh, Walls and Cromit. I think those are also based off like books. Oh, really? So like in terms of uh, ragtag uh, silly pirates, I much preferred that world over Captain Pugwash's, but I also need to put Captain Pugwash. It reminded me of an episode of Gilligan's Island. Not that there's like a one to one uh like uh, correlation there with the characters, but it's similar and it's like everybody is bumbling but no one gets hurt and like it's you know, it's all okay in the end, but there's a little bit of drama in the middle. I was a really big fan of Gilligan's Island when I was like seven and eight. And I feel oh, wait, so it early, does not hold up. And I, yeah, I feel so early <laughs> that I would probably be a fan of this book as a small child. I saw an episode a couple years ago of Good Against Island uh, discussing gender roles. Oh, no. Holy fuck. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. my God. I can only imagine. Yeah. Not good. Not not good, guys. But anyway, I also, I enjoyed the um, the illustration of this book. I enjoy uh, the slightly larger eyes than usual. Not like, <laughs> not like obnoxious and like a crying anime character kind of way, but just like a little bit to make him a bit like always like looking concerned. He does always, yeah. he always, he always looks concerned. He always looks like he doesn't really know what's going on. I think the illustrations are adorable. Um, I think this is a really good children's book. And I think Adam's crazy. <laughs> what do you like about it? I think that it is a, it is a, it's nice because it has a story. Like it has like, there's a lot of words, like stuff happens <laughs> No, but, like, look, like, a lot of picture books are, like, look at the duck, right? Like, this is, like, it has a story. It has a, like, 
story that I think has just enough sort of drama when he gets thrown overboard to, like, make a kid be like, oh, shit. Um, I mean, I think, and, and similarly, the dramatic irony of even a very small child is able to be like, oh, yeah, the giant boat full of gold. Don't do that, Captain Pugwash. That's dumb. Um, but, like, and then, and then I think it's nice that, you know, you get the little, like, the unsung hero bit at the end, and everyone's happy. Like, it's very pleasant. It's not boring. I didn't know exact. I, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen at every turn. Like, I mean, the whole, like, the pirates blowing themselves up, I was like, I, like, cool. Like, didn't see that coming. I can see, like, like five- and seven-year-old kids going, yay! And, like, being huge fans. Like, this is a great children's book! This is everything a children's book should be! It's got adorable illustrations and a cute story... And it's great. I think it needs a stronger villain, though. I, think I, 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 I will, I'll give you there. I'll give you that. But he's, but I like his little. I liked the line that says like, and he used a lot of bad words, and even his crew blushed. Like, but you know, there's like, and one of these like what thirty sequels, there's bound to be like a sea monster villain or like a ghost. Yeah. Villain. Like, but but there are cooler villains than uh, than this dude. One would hope because like, it's like a grumpy guy. I don't know. Either that or it's always this guy. Like you know, it like that, it, that will get old super yeah. fast. This seems like the Joker to Pugwash's Batman now. I mean, to the extent that Pugwash is a Batman. <laughs> exactly. So, I agree with all of what you said, Sarah. It does have a story. It's just that, to me, the, the, the lesson of the story seems to be that you can have foresight and um, knowledge and uh, can do, like, a good work ethic, but in the end, the person with the dumb luck, the person who's in charge is going to reap all the rewards and the glory. But, like, Tom gets gold. Everyone gets gold at the end. Like, it's a happy crew, and Tom seems, like, more of the, like, content unsung hero, where he, he, I think Tom just, uh, just, uh, you know, thrives on self-satisfaction. Like, this is a kid who sleeps well at night because he knows that without him, this whole fucking ship would fall apart. He is the only one who knows how to make tea. And he's cool with that. He's the power behind the throne. And, he, like, he's happy there. Do we know the titles of the sequels? Is there a mutiny of Captain Pugwash? Probably oh, not. <laughs> That'd be awesome. That would be awesome. Uh, Adam, you had the, the book in your, your bunk this week. Did you have a chance to listen to the, the CD that was attached to this book? I did not, no. I'm curious, because uh, like, this is a, a franchise in, in British children's literature. And uh, this book that we have came with a CD of uh, Jim Broadbent reading this book aloud. Oh. And uh, I'm going to take a listen after the podcast to hear uh, him. But since I, uh, he's on Game of Thrones this season. Yeah. Maybe he'll bum, also bum, read bum, this bum, one. Bum, 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 no, no, bum, no, 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 no. So there is, I'm looking up the title of the other Captain Pugwash books. Captain Pugwash and the Sea Monster. Great. Okay, see, I, I call that, I call Sea Monster a uh, villain. Um... Captain Pugwash and the Mutiny. Holy shit! Is it number three? No, it's oh number three. No, I I didn't know like if I, I I'm not naming every sequel. Like, is it go like Sea Monster and the Mutiny? No, no. Oh, it's Sea Monster is like the fifth one. Mutiny okay. is like looks like fifteenth, sixteenth. Wow. Uh, Bunkum Bay, Golden Handshake. The last one was that 1991 called Captain Pugwash and the Huge Reward. Well, I, I do enjoy the the map he had. Like he had to stretch. Oh, map. his map was adorable. It was like monsters in the corner, five islands all marked Treasure Island, and yeah. like we're here. Um, what what's that? Uh, I am blanking on a basic word. What's that uh, thing that you can get? Scurvy. Is yeah. our Captain Pugwash get scurvy? Oh uh, no, no. <laughs> that one is sponsored by the NHS. <laughs> yeah. No sad. Uh, no sad. No sad <laughs> enemies. Oh, okay. I mean. There's a fancy dress party. Of course there is. Uh, oh my gosh. To me, to me, pirates already kind of dress kind of fancy. Let's see, like, the ones that just, like, wear, like, a vest and that's it. They're so, like... because Marion is not recording our scores, I just want to tell the listeners what's happening here. I've been writing down the scores to record them for later. The cat has sat on top of those scores where I've been writing them, so I moved the <laughs> scores down the page. So the cat moved her butt down the page so that she is over the entire thing and is... Right next to the microphone, as if about to speak into it, yeah, and sitting he, on my sitting on my paper. I said it makes her feel cozy and secure. I said, "Don't take the cat into space." 
He said she'll be fine. Yep. Yeah. Well, she would be really oh, no, sad definitely. if we weren't there. Like, she'd uh, be so sad. It was a good idea to bring the cat yeah, to space. It's a good idea to bring the cat anytime you're traveling. Like, yeah, straight up. He's a good kitty. Sure. But also, she's the worst. Adam, do you have any final thoughts on uh, Captain Pugwash? I've said my piece. I don't think you're very peaceful. It's P-I-E-C-E. Oh. Uh, isn't it? Yes, you say your piece. P-I-E-C-E. Yeah. Commonly, commonly said wrong. But really, are you guys fucking with me? No, no, that's absolutely the case. You guys are fucking with me. No, I don't believe you're... you. Wait, you, you. Yeah, you, you've said your piece. Your morsel of. You are. You have to say. Yeah, the, the P E A C E. You guys are wrong. I will Google it for you right now. I know, but you are. No, I, I'm, I'm fine there. I just never heard. I guess I've always said it out loud. No one's been able to correct me. They just assume don't, I was you right. Don't. You haven't my... said your. Abstaining of violence. That just doesn't make sense. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is crazy. Alright, um, no, I, I don't know if you call it out further. Anyway, uh, what do you, what do you give it, hinge wise, Adam? 2.1. Jesus! I give it 3.8. This is a great choice because you're probably gonna be people. 4.3. No, I, it's one that I'm sure I'll like a sequel more, but as a, as a first entry, Okay, fine. It's fine, but I thought it was... Uh... Wait, this is a children's book that Sarah likes more than everyone else? That often happens. Lee that hates happens, children, not me. Every I, single time. So I, I love children. children. Yes. Yeah. But you hate children's books. I don't. I love children's books. I hate children's books. What, do all women sound the same to you, Pedro? No, I just... I, 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 I last episode, we uh, brought up that you tend to not like children's books. No, but... she doesn't like that we tear apart the children's book. That's what uh, I don't like uh, the children's uh, book okay. segment. Well, this has because like everyone's grumpy. Well, this is three times as many words as three robbers from last week. Mm-hmm. So, it, it comes down to it's under 100 words the whole book. Sarah question why we're talking about for That minutes. is that is accurate. So that that's the sure. issue. Okay. But anyway, mm-hmm. this is a uh, Captain Pugwash by Jack Ryan. John Ryan? John Ryan. John Jack Ryan, Jack Ryan is a... Uh... Tom Clancy character. Yes. Yes. Tom Cruise. Nope. Nope. Didn't he play Jack Ryan recently? No, it was uh, Alex Harrison Baldwin, Ford. Harrison Ford twice, yeah. uh, Ben Affleck, and then Chris Pine. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're thinking and, of Jack Reacher. Uh, yeah, that's who I'm yes. thinking of. That's it. Also, they're making a, a Jack Ryan TV show starring uh, Jim from The Office. John Krasinski? Weird. That is weird. Oh, Should we talk about uh, a different show? Oh. Do you want to transition from Jack Ryan, the the widest name of all time, to Jefferson? Is that what you want to do? I do. Okay. The Jeffersons is this week's TV show. I'm moving on up to the east side, to the deluxe apartments in the sky. Oh, 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 Jeffersons is a spinoff of All in the Family, one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time, and this is also one of the most beloved sitcoms of all time. It is rare for a spinoff to be this good, for one thing. It is the story of George Jefferson and his family, as uh, Sarah sang and as the clip sang. Moving on up, from Queens to Manhattan, now uh, after working really hard, George Jefferson owns uh, several uh, dry cleaning stores, and he's now rich. I mean, he, he lives in a really nice condo in in Manhattan, and uh, you kind of just you you watch their life. And this is now the second show in a row we're covering that's created by Norman Lear, who is considered one of the greatest TV producers of all time for a reason. I mean, not only does he make these shows with incredible characters. 
that are just funny as hell, but they, they're, they're poignant in a way that just shows art. And like, I watched two seasons of the Jeffersons for this show, and I now, I, I feel like I, I'm getting Norman Lear more, and now I'm gonna only be watching Norman Lear from now on. He is, he gets these characters that are, that are not easy to define sitcom characters, and he just lets them live, and because they're taking things that are, that are normal, um, to them, it's probably not seen to the rest of America, and then it becomes fascinating. The debates they're having over these issues are utterly fascinating, and it has characters who aren't easily preaching on any direction. Uh, George Jefferson, I've now seen over 30 episodes Such of. Such a turd! I, I can't, like, define him in the simple words of, like, bumbling dad. Cause, no. I mean, he is a bumbling dad, but he's not a bumbling dad. Uh, He's an asshole, yeah. but that's like that's not all he is. No, uh, he's most he's, of what he is. He's he's an inspiring character, but also he's an asshole, bumbling dad. Um, it, but it's fundamentally George Jefferson does not give a fuck about <laughs> what you think at all. I mean, like he just like if if you know him well, and yet if you if to the outside world appearances everything, but to the people in his family, yeah, fuck you, like. I was saying exactly what I want to say. I'm old, and I started a business, and fuck all y'all. <laughs> he, he's he's incredible, and the actor playing him is so funny because he is this shorter guy who is balding, but still has like a perfectly like short afro. He calls it afro at one point, but it's, it's just like he's always wearing a nice suit now, but he still is so animated as he runs around and yells at everything. He's just He's great. fucking funny, and his wife is so good, and uh, his son's actually in college, so we don't have, like, stupid, like, ten-year-old plots about, like, finger painting on the walls and such. I know it's not ten-year-olds, but yeah, you, you get tired okay. of sitcom kids pretty fast. Oh, yeah, it's no, kind of cool that the only real. kid is dealing with way bigger issues than, than a crush. Um, you also have the other main couple in the building who is a mixed race uh, marriage and also the, who are fascinating. And then also you have and George Jefferson has thoughts, very negative thoughts about it. And then you also have this kind British man who works for the UN, who just <laughs> likes to have friends. And he's like, the only one who's never prejudiced is like never really thinking about race that much. And he's like the classic like like sitcom jester, you know, like lots of sitcoms have this sort of like bumbling neighbor character, bumbling jester character. And that's what Rolly plays, but he's he's just still he's just nice. But like but like Kramer on Seinfeld is destructive. He is right, exactly. he's like Jared on Silicon Valley. Like he's super nice. He's very funny to laugh at. Also he keeps having like secretly sad past that keeps being brought up. Yeah. It, but yeah. I mean in the first episode, you have them moving into their new condo, and they're concerned about the work towards the condo, and they're considering the politics, what it is to hire a mate. I mean, there are people yeah. who did not have money until recently, and what does it kind of mean to hire help, especially hire a, a black woman as a, as a black family, right. and it's in the politics of that. And then the episode kind of goes further into race relations with um, the working class, and ultimately, the the N word is is shouted. Yeah. George Jefferson says the N word in the first episode, <laughs> and he says in a way of like talking about how marriages argue and how when you argue, you're you also reveal your worst self and you you say the thing that hurt you the most. And he criticizes the the mixed race couple and says, you know, because you know we never argue like that. And he says you can't because you'll call her this. Yeah. And the, I mean, the show is, like, there's an episode where, because uh, the mixed-race couple have two kids, and one of them um, is lighter-skinned than the other one, and he kind of talks about how he actually often says he's white when he's in different cities, and kind of what it means for their identity. And they talk about suicide in a fascinating way. They talk about class in mean, every episode. They talk about expectations of, of black Americans in the 70s. And... It's, it's always funny though. It, it's it, so funny. It doesn't. It it doesn't. It very special episodes. Almost every episode in that, like, almost every every episode is like 
they're all about something. Like, yeah, I I, I watched probably about ten episodes total, a little more. and yeah. and there weren't any that were just like I think my friends like you know the, the fr- one of one of the like classic friends uh, ones is the one where no one's ready, which is a sitcom plot where like. I mean, it's about how none of them are ready to leave the that house, a, right? That's a really good episode, though. Right, I mean, yeah, it is, yeah. right? But, but, but like, th- this is this is not that. Like, they don't. I had, I didn't see any just like total fluff episodes. There's always something going on that's a little bit interesting. Well, any kind of fluff. I mean, there's an episode where they forgot the mom's birthday, but that still means yeah, uh, many things. Oh, oh, good. We get to talk about mom, oh, Mother Jefferson. Love- Mother Jefferson <laughs> is the best character that's ever been on television in the history of television. I am obsessed with her. Um, I mean, I one of the things I noticed about the show that I think is really interesting is Wait, that... Wait, I guess they what? She's all good. Yeah, no, that's what... Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm about to... I apologize, I apologize. Is that no one is, um... No one's young. I mean, Lionel pops in a little while, like, occasionally, but, like... It is show about old people. Like, I mean, it's two... It's a middle-aged to older middle-aged couple, and then it's Mama Jefferson, who is an elderly woman, who is... Savage. Just like, just, just biting and savage in a way that I love so much. And I want to be her best friend, except that all she would ever say to me would be rude and like syrupy sweet and then really mean. She drinks more than any sitcom could ever see. She's just the best. I mean, she she loves her Bloody Marys, but there's a great episode where there's an older man who's hitting on her, and it's the the grandpa from Mary Hart Mary Hartman, which is wonderful. But he he keeps flirting with her, and she keeps going, "Well, I don't know, I don't know." He just has some tea, and then he pulls out bourbon from his coat and, and pulls them into the the two glasses and gives it to her, and she just goes, mm, "I love this. Is the best tea I've had in a long time." And they talk for a while, then he's pouring some more. And she goes, put more bourbon in it this time. Yeah. And he goes, you know? And he goes, of course I know. Yeah, like, the, she, she just because she does lot. that all the time. Yeah. She, and, uh, I mean, she's great. And to, to cover what I was saying earlier about, like, I'm, I'm now getting Norman Lear. Because I've, I've seen a little bit of All in the Family. I've now seen a lot of Mary Hart and Mary Hartman. And now uh, quite a bit of the Jeffersons. The edginess is sincere. I mean, right. It, it is, it's comedy in the edginess, and the edginess is there to have a conversation and to have representation. And there are a couple shows now that are, uh, on the air, or recently it's been off the air, that I like a lot that want to be the modern day Norman Lear, but aren't that. Yeah. Um, which are, I think, Blackish and The Carmichael Show. Uh, two shows, again, I think are very good, and they're very sweet, but they're in a saturated network environment. That wouldn't air the Jeffersons today. Uh, yeah, you could, like I just like it is bonkers how much you not only could you not make the Jeffersons today, if you aired the Jeffersons in prime time today, I think people would be shocked in a weird way. Like there is a level of frankness, particularly about conversations about race. I mean, it's it's pre nineties, and although I am generally think that the concept that political correctness is ruining America is overblown. I mean, we we have softened our language so much and veered away in popular culture from serious topics, particularly in prime time, I think. Well, that's, that, the, like, that's, the, that's the myth, right, of political correctness, because there's an episode, uh, Point Blank, where George Jefferson says, I need a new manager, and I'm not going to hire her because she's a woman. Yeah. I don't want a woman manager. I have no interest in that whatsoever. Uh, this is not a woman's job. And you have everyone on the show yelling at him about this. Yeah, like, what everyone, the fuck is wrong with everyone. you? Everyone. Like, and you have him, point blank, being sexist the way it's organic to the whole character so far. That is not the Jefferson's being sexist. Right. So that is not political incorrectness. Right. That is a conversation about sex. Like, but the, the things that are said about women in that episode by him... Like, who is painted as the villain of that episode. Uh, you, I really genuinely feel like you couldn't air those on primetime now. There's like a level of, everyone would just be so shocked about what George Jefferson said about, like, women. You know, I mean, it's just, we have a, we just have a different mindset about how to talk about these things. And mostly there's lots of ways in which it's good don't get me wrong there there are reasons there are important reasons to avoid 
I mean, just, yeah. I mean, there, there, are, there are good reasons we don't have characters of any race spewing the N-word on, you know, during primetime now. There is a normalization of that word that is probably damaging, and which certainly the African-American community as a whole has generally said is damaging, which is why we don't do it anymore. But, like, we are... We don't do this kind of straight satire. I think the cl- like that that the whole point is to satirize, is to have a a heel kind of to have a guy who is the voice of everyone's worst opinions, and then to mess with that. I think the show there's an episode, and, and Thirty Rock occasionally does this throughout the show, but. There is an episode of 30 Rock, which people either loved or they hated, um, where Tina Fey, where there's a female comic on the show whose entire persona is being a sexy baby. Oh, yeah. That Tina Fey and, and, and Liz Lemon, like, hates her and goes on this, like, goes on this campaign to try and, like, save her from herself. She's the mother. What? Hi, I'm at your mother. It, oh, yeah, she is. That's true. But, like, it, that episode, which is, it feels like, I was thinking, like, what in modern sitcoms would I say is like this? That episode is, and people hated that Liz Lemon said those things about another woman, even though the whole fucking point of the episode was that she was wrong. Well, like, I, I you know? Was, I think it was Tina Fey, or it was an anonymous quote that's not been gone to Tina Fey, were saying that. Uh, when women will be equal in sitcoms when they're allowed to be bad at their job. Yeah. And so, like, Blackish and the Carmichael show, shows I think are rather good, uh, one more than the other. They, they don't have any ugly characters. Yeah. They don't, they don't have any ugly moments or ugly scenes like the Jeffersons is, is bringing up to do. I think it's so interesting that Norman Lear, who's still alive, by the way. Yeah. Because he's, Dude, he's old. And also, still fucking badass. Yeah. Um, I mean, he wasn't, like, super involved, but I mean, he, Helped develop one of his own shows, One Day at a Time, which was a wonderful remake on, on Netflix this year. Um, I mean, he just had a documentary out about himself. The guy's fascinating. And I think it's so interesting, like, what, what show is he, like, what is appointment viewing for him? And it's South Park. It's awesome. And that's it's so actually true. closest to Norman Lear. Those characters are allowed to be ugly for the sake of a political <laughs> conversation. And, I mean, he loves South Park so much, he keeps sitting on the writing's room. He um, officiated so the wedding of, I think, Matt Stone or Trey Parker, one of those two, uh, or to each other. I don't know. Um, like, that that's it. it. It's, it's, there's something dangerous about saying that every life is, is leave it to beaver perfect. And we're still doing that in today's uh, sitcoms. And Mary, Hart- Mary Hartman is a heightened universe, and Jefferson's is typical sitcom heightened universe but it's just so damn good it oh god i mean it's like it's it's a really really good show and uh uh very powerful i'm gonna give this a uh 4.7 i'm only going this low because i saw two seasons out of 11 and i'm sure it hits even higher strides that i can't wait to see also i just looked on wikipedia to say that the show was canceled without telling them. They didn't get their own series finale, oh, which sucks. is fucking bullshit. That sucks. And uh, even though I openly hate this show, again, according to Wikipedia, the Jeffersons are in the series finale of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air ha! to buy their house. So at least the way there is be a closure epilogue That's to their story. Fun. So, but That's delightful. But seriously, uh, screw Fresh Prince. Okay. I loved what I saw. Um... I, 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 it's not, it's not quite my kind of comedy that I watch just for funsies, but it's amazing and everyone should watch it. 4.6. Alright, that is The Jeffersons. It is available in many places, but if you happen to have uh, a Star subscription, which you should, it's good shows on that now, or just get a couple free weeks trial. We're all there. So I watched it on my spaceship in the sky. Yeah. I call it the Space Sky now. Woo! That's episode eighty five. Ooh. Ooh. Did it? We. This is this is good. This was like a. This the was, meaty. This is the meaty stuff. Yeah. And cartoon pirates. Oh yeah. Yeah. To Adam's amusement. Yeah. Yeah.
He's so excited. He loves cartoon pirates. Ah, oh, man. Cartoon pirates? What? Nothing. What's he saying? No one else. No. Doesn't matter. We should probably get uh, next week's episode. Um, Marion, uh, enable see- random number picker. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Marion, volume down. Fuck you. Fuck you. Marion, personality switch off. Sorry, guys, I just murdered someone for a little bit. Don't worry, they'll be back. Uh, how do we pick a number? I don't know, just pick one. I'm good with that. Someone pick a number. 429! Wow, that was, uh, that was good. That was, uh, that was good, good random. Alright, what's 429? Right. Look it up in our, our books and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doop. Doop-a-doo. Ooh, I have a song called Dancing Queen by ABBA. <gasps> That's such a good song! I will find out. The, the album... Oh, go no, ahead you. Now. You, you, you. Okay, this, the album is Street Life by Crusaders. The children's book is Arsene Lupin, Gentleman Burglar by Maurice LeBlanc. Uh, the food is smoked trout. The movie is The Battle of Algiers. Oh, shit. Fuck yeah. That sounds... <laughs> we haven't Damn. had a, a foreign heavy film in a while. Yeah. Right? What, what's the TV show? TV show is just like that. It's... Beverly Hills 90210. Ah. <laughs> I, I assume Beverly Hills are dog tags. And this is about like no. Corporal Hills no. who has to go sure. through no. yeah. the treks Why not? and no. really find out who he is. No, nope. it's Beverly Hills 90210, guys. God damn it. It's real dumb. It's a real dumb show. You uh, might get PTSD from it. <laughs> I might watch too many episodes and lose my mind. Mm-hmm. That seems right. Again. Uh, but. Battle of Algiers is on Filmstruck. Beverly Hills Now 210 is on Hulu. Other stuff is other places. Sure. But uh, thank you all for listening. You guys are fantastic in yeah. making this uh, uh, yep. possibly never-ending space voyage uh, worthwhile. You guys are great. Show show. We want to hear what you thought about today's episode, so go over to theartomore.com and uh, leave your comment on this episode or any episode. Let us know what you think of it. And... Uh, you can also email us if you're shy at the immortals at the art You can follow us on Twitter at the immortals pod. All the episodes go up on YouTube at the immortals. Let's take five. Yesterday I had its Charlie Chaplin wrap up and announced that the next five is going to be about Robert Altman. Cool. Um, hmm. So tomorrow we're doing the episode of MASH, which I love. And um, also, fun reason to check out the new episode of Ad Absurdum is that there's a new variation on the Let's Take Five theme done by Mr. Adam Lord. Who uh, you can find out, uh, find more of his music at songsbyalord.com. That's right. You want to say more about it? Well, it's really right now, my, it's just the uh, three theme songs for the Heart of Mortal podcast. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, it's fun but those are pretty cool. Yeah. No, I like them. Um, so it's kind of like a little hobby, I guess, that I'm starting. So if you have good podcasts, artwork also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you have any need for music, email us. Yeah. And We're also, uh, as you mentioned, there is uh, a third podcast on com. I promise it's real. <laughs> We're recording this week, for real, guys. We're going to do Westworld. It's going to be great. We're going to talk about consciousness. It's going to be good times. And then you'll have a new episode next week. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, very soon. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Westworld. That'd be really cool, uh, especially because there's like a new trailer out for season two, I think. Hells yeah, there is. So, uh. Can I bring back Marion? Speaking just, of. Let's just, uh. We'll let her sleep, I guess. Just uh, turn her volume back on, but let's not, like, go talk to her because I feel like she's trying to murder us all. But, uh, we'll be I fine. I actually really think she's just trying to kill you, primarily. Okay, I, 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 but All for one Personality word. Personality on volume up. There we go. Okay. Um, and now that's the end of this episode. Uh, thank you all for listening. My name is Austin. I'm Adam. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. I'm Pedro. This is my ship now. That's fine by me. All the California, California coming home. I'm going to see the folks I dig. 
I'll even kiss a sunset peak. California, I'm coming home. I met a redneck on a Grecian Isle who did the goat dance very well. He gave me back my smile, but he kept my camera in a cell. Oh, the rogue, the red, red rogue. He cooked good omelets and stews, and I might have stayed on with him there, but my heart cried out for you, California. Oh, California, coming home. Oh, make me feel good, rock and roll band. I'm your biggest fan, California, coming home. Blue Jasmine was not an original screenplay.